Right. So I don't have to tell you the names of our panelists this morning. You can see them here, and that's the reason you signed up in the first place. Uh, but I think it is uh, probably a good idea if we go around real quick, uh, just give us um, kind of a quick recap of who you are and why we should listen to you. So Keith, your face is first up on my list. Oh, yeah. So I've got 20 slides introduced. No, I'm kidding. Um, so yeah, I'm an a API guy from a while back. Uh, I was an early evangelist at Twilio back in the day where we spent a lot of time teaching people, yes, building on APIs is a safe and useful thing to do. Uh, let's see, I was over at Okta for a few years working on their API security product, API access management. I was there for about five years. Uh, now I'm at Ingrock, um, building out, expanding our API, teaching people how to use it. And I'd say uh, I wrote the book on API design. Uh, and I, you could tell that because the URL is theapidesignbook.com. And I wrote that with uh, one of our other panelists here, James. Mr. Domain hook line for everything. It's amazing. <laughs> All right. There's your uh, segue, James. Well, thanks, uh, James Higginbotham. I'm with Launch Any. I uh, work with a lot of organizations to help them establish, grow, and mature their API programs. So that goes from training to consulting, helping to get all the bits and bobs and processes and everything in place when it comes to APIs. And as Keith said, he and I wrote a book together a while back. And uh, I also uh, just recently published a book with Addison Wesley, uh, Principles of Web API Design as well. So I focus on design and on um, the full API lifecycle. All right, Mr. Tom. Yeah, my name is Tom Johnson. I'm a technical writer based in Seattle. I've worked for startups, big tech, uh, working on API and developer documentation. And I'm probably most well known for my blog and API course, I'd rather be writing.com. A lot of tech writers who are looking to kind of get into the developer documentation space, uh, find that resource helpful. And I try to kind of keep a keep tabs on the pulse of the tech comm industry. What are the trends and what are the other kind of big issues that tech writers are wrestling with and how, how can we integrate better into the API doc space? Very nice. Uh, well, gentlemen, thank you for uh, taking time out of your day. Um, not that your time is more valuable than our guests, but it's probably a little more valuable by the hour uh, <laughs> at any rate. Uh, so, we were chatting before a little bit about, you know, where should we kick this thing off? And I think if, um, if y'all are anything like uh, like our shop or folks we talk to, everyone's trying to figure out what's the, uh, what are we going to do with this chat GPT stuff? What does it mean? Uh, so <laughs> let's kick off there with kind of this prevalence of uh, AI based things. And I it hurts me every time I say AI because I know it doesn't mean anything, uh, but chat GPT is the buzz right now. Um, so how do y'all see this sort of influencing, um, you know, the API space and how tools and approaches might change. I'm not going to name anyone and see if anyone feels really passionately about it this morning. I can, uh, I can jump in briefly. Um, you know, my, my experience with it has been one of um, finding that if you have a good grasp on API design and then something like chat GPT and those other types of AI co-generation solutions are really powerful and that you can have them kind of speed up some of the boilerplate work. But I haven't seen anything come out that actually has been designed in a, in a well thought out way. Uh, I had it design a few different APIs for me and it came up with all kinds of squirrely ways of, of doing things. It was pretty inconsistent in the same session. And so it takes a little while to kind of get it where it needs to be, but I think it's a really nice tool to have off to the side. Uh, to have it kind of help turn something into, uh, you know, machine readable specifications like open API spec, or maybe to kind of help out with it. And uh, definitely can see it more on the consumption side, maybe speeding up that side of things quite a bit, because given a spec, it can write some some nice code to be able to work with something. But the design side is a little rougher right now. Yeah, I I, I recently actually did a, a survey on my blog, just trying to find out what I don't know, other tech writers thought would be the impact of AI in their in their careers. And you know, there's a lot of uh there's a lot of uncertainty, I would say, in the profession right now. Um, uh, but honestly, I think that uh, a lot of people are kind of interested and intrigued and excited about the potential to leverage some of these tools in writing docs. As James was saying, um, it can can be something that that helps you get uh 
first draft of something out, um, gen generating content. Uh, I I've seen a lot of, I mean, it's mostly speculation at this point, but one interesting comment somebody made was that uh, these tools could take information from a lot of different sources and create a kind of content mashup um, that would weave together uh, so many different perspectives into more of a single single voice. That was from a, a Zoom in paper. Um, but but yeah, I think there there's uncertainty, but also kind of intrigue at the possibilities for these tools. Yeah, I'd, I'd say I, I'm. I don't know if I'm the skeptic. I try to be a, the pragmatist of, of any given bunch, and I think. Uh, on the design side, I think you're right that it has the potential to offer you a new perspective and look at things and, and see how it maps things out. Um, that said, if if you still don't know how to do design, getting a tool, getting another perspective on something you don't know isn't valuable. It's not useful at all. You'll just do more bad things faster. And that's the last thing we need, especially in the API design. I mean, the APIs we launch if we're even remotely successful, we'll live 5, 10, 15 years. I mean, it took Twilio, what, 13 years to deprecate their 2008 API. I mean, these are the kind of decisions we have to live with. So I would say we have to be very thoughtful, um, use it as a perspective, but that doesn't absolve you of the responsibilities of still understanding the principles underneath it all. Um, then again, most of us don't have to worry about things like writing inodes at this point or memory management or garbage collection or anything like this point. So I'd say the current generation may not be there, but we're not far from having some really useful tools that will do some specific things very well. Um, I'd say on the generation side of things, like using a um, uh, an open API spec to generate SDKs, I saw a demo, I think it was using the Twilio open API spec recently, like, man, that sucked. Like the parameters, it had like three parameters and then like all these nulls because there are all these optional things that the 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 AI, the, the chat GPT or whatever it was, didn't know what to do with. So again, we still need to apply some intelligence here and say, okay, these are parameters that are used very rarely. We They don't need to be top level, uh, you know, input parameters to this method. We need to look at them a little bit differently. So yeah, I mean, it's a useful tool, but we still have to know how the foundation of things. Yeah, I, I look at like, you know, I don't know, five, six years ago, maybe a little longer you hear low code, no code, it's coming, engineers are all going to be out of work, right? Here it comes. And I think kind of the way I looked at that, uh, that last sort of disruptive wave is like, here's a cheap way to get thing to, to build and validate something quickly. But if you're really getting serious about building a business around something, you're going to bring in craftsmen to build bespoke things, right? Um, so I look at kind of the chat GPT stuff in terms of our kind of API world in a similar fashion that like uh, it, you'll probably be able to do a lot of interesting quick stuff, but um, I am highly suspect that, you know, it's just going to do it all perfectly and fit all the use cases. I'm with Keith though, though. Uh, definitely keep a thing to keep an eye on because uh, things are moving shockingly fast. Well, and this this is the prime premise of the innovator's dilemma. If any of you have read this, it, uh, any of our audience has read this or hasn't read it, please stop and do it. Basically, it says when there's an incumbent in the space, there's a new entrant and the new entrant can't do as much. It's not as high quality. It, it can't deliver the same thing. But the price point is a fraction of what it is. And over time, this steadily improves. And eventually it reached the point where it addresses enough of the capabilities, enough of the functionality, enough of the need at still a fraction of the price that eventually that incumbent is usurped. So I think we've seen this pattern time and time again in a lot of different spaces. We just need to keep an eye on it. Yep. Well put. Um, and, you know, I, I think, uh, Keith, you just set up a nice segue there um, with a little bit of what I consider some old school product management advice there. Um, within kind of the API space, we see, uh, you know, I know certainly at Stoplight, we've seen this uh, kind of rise of the API uh, product manager in the last few years. And we've got this whole kind of API first tagline getting thrown around the executive world. Um, I'm curious, you know, how you guys are kind of looking at this uh, really shift to thinking of APIs as products over the last few years and where it's going from here. Uh, James, you're up. Okay. Um, 
You know, I've I've been focused heavily in the enterprise IT space for the last uh, decade or so. I have worked with some software as a service companies along the way, but most of my engagements are enterprise IT. And it's been just absolutely astounding to me how many roles now are product owner or product manager in the enterprise IT space. They're still trying to navigate and understand what does it really mean to launch a product. Some enterprises are better than others at that uh, when, it, when it comes to launching a software product, in which case, if they're a little bit better at it, then their transition to, AP, to the API space has been a little bit easier. They can think about APIs as products a little bit easier. It takes a little bit of thinking because there's not necessarily a UI on their UI or the, is the documentation or you know the try it out or some code or something else sometimes, uh, at least in the initial iterations. But uh, I've been seeing a, a, quite an uptick on uh, enterprises shifting in that direction. And it's been quite uh, exciting from my perspective to be able to blend those two worlds. So the enterprise is starting to figure out how do I act more like a startup and move a little bit quicker and manage products and, uh, and, and doing that with APIs. So now they're trying to figure out, okay, who, who's my audience? Who am I really trying to reach out to? Am I targeting developers specifically or am I targeting my existing market places that I already have, my market segments, my business lines are looking at different ways to engage with the market in an automated fashion. And there's a lot of demand coming to the enterprises now to say, we need APIs. So I remember during the SOA days, we saw that a lot. A lot of people were like, well, where's your SOAP service? Where's your SOAP service? And we had a lot of that coming up. But this is at a, a, a much faster scale. This isn't, well, we'll get something up in the next year or two. It's you need to have something up by the next quarter or else we're, we're not going to choose you as a partner. We're going to go to someone else. And so you can actually have a lot of customer churn, even in the enterprise space, by not productizing your digital capabilities, your APIs, and so on. So it's it's been quite a quite a shift in the last I'd say about two to three years Keith you got to be chewing in your tongue with opinions over there oh yeah yeah I was giving everyone else a chance to speak first though because uh <laughs> yeah I don't want to be greedy uh so I, I kind of come at things uh from the exact opposite point of view of James I've been a startup guy for years like even when I was at Okta you know I joined up early on and then was helping enterprises go through that transition and it's what I think is really interesting about it is that the people now that are leading these initiatives are people who were, you know, in the trenches 10, 12 years ago, the the, the sort of first movers in the space. Um, and I, th I think that's great because they've got some lessons learned. They might have some bruises from last time around and they're they're that much better informed. And when I was at, at Okta, for example, we we helped Experian go through their, their API journey and Pitney Bowes. And these big companies are traditionally not for not, not in the forefront, not thought leaders in the space. We're doing really interesting, powerful things. Uh, most of those are done over multiple years. So they're having to figure out how to deliver faster. And I think that's that's really kind of a, a cool thing about it. I think part of that is uh, market pressure. You've got all these upstarts, the you know the, these incumbents in active in the space and all these upstarts coming up and delivering key pieces of their functionality and a lot faster. I mean, look at fintech, look at shipping, look at all these logistics operational side of things. They're delivering a lot of that faster by APIs. And these incumbents are looking behind them and saying, oh, these guys are catching up. We need to figure out how to ship better, how to ship faster, how to ship uh, with less code. And I, I think APIs is just how they're doing it. So I, I'm excited about it. The, and the people who are leading these efforts now have been there, done that, um, usually in the commercial space, but now they're bringing those skills and that experience in-house. I would just I would just add uh, on this whole topic of APIs as products. Um, you know, this is one of the neat things about being a tech writer in the developer space is that the the documentation serves as the interface for how users interact with and experience the product. Uh, there's not like a separate UI that people get, and you know, docs are are taking a back seat. It's it, you put docs in in the in the forefront of the product experience. And as such, tech writers can really capitalize on like this interaction point with the users to help channel that incoming feedback, the usage patterns, the questions, the tickets, and all this stuff uh, back into these product teams to help shape those APIs. So many teams that I work with are really kind of insulated from 
the users, uh, the, the developers who are actually using the APIs. And a lot of times tech writers don't understand that we're in this perfect uh, position to capitalize on that user feedback. Yeah. Um, it's. It, it, I think it's part of why like the whole API first tagline, much like any other, you know, sort of label that pops up, it's always a little annoying for folks that are already doing things like that um for me like docs first as part of your approach is probably a good idea too right much like uh and you know certainly can somewhat contentious but design first i think increasingly too so i think the first is like which things are you doing up front that, that needs to be unpacked uh product is certainly one of those things but uh, tom can agree more that making docs part of the development process and not just chucking things over the silo is uh it's definitely changing and uh, i can't encourage listeners enough to take that seriously because <laughs> it makes a huge difference um i'll say too that i think putting docs at the front of the process takes a lot of load off of like qa and stuff right uh, writers can be your best qa in a lot of ways uh, just by looking at it from a consumption standpoint early on love that um, I guess another kind of category of, uh, of trends high level here that maybe we can unpack a little bit is this sort of, you know, for a long time it was, you know, are you getting off bare metal and onto cloud and exceedingly now it's like, are you, uh, digging in with cloud with Kubernetes and infrastructure as code and all these sorts of things? Like, how do y'all see sort of the, you know, this modern infrastructure change bringing about, um, you know, changes to how we build, design, scale out API-based infrastructure and document it uh, for what it's worth here too. Um, so let's see, uh, Tom, we'll start with, uh, since you finished up with doc stuff, do you feel like kind of uh, internal shifts in infrastructure kind of stuff has uh, changed the way that we have to look at documenting these things? Well, I think there's definitely been a, a shift towards more cloud-based authoring tools. You have remote distributed teams, they all need to, to coordinate and collaborate. And there's really been a lot of um, transition into docs as code tooling as, as sort of the standard. You know, five, 10 years ago, this was a new approach to sort of model software development workflows with documentation. Um, and now it's just become the default uh, because it provides a kind of nice way of working when you're when you need to bring all this content together into one centralized source. Um, but yeah, and, and Tom, for listeners, give give us like a quick recap of what docs as code means. Uh, well, it's using oftentimes version control, uh, such as Git or some other uh, system where you can um, basically clone a source and merge in your changes and so on, and then you you publish uh, using a command line uh, that that pushes the content and it kicks off builds and so on using static site generators. This was a very uncommon in the tech comm world 10 years ago. No, nobody really did this except engineers. Uh, people, a lot of tech writers had their own tooling. Uh, it was programs you installed locally on your computer. And then you had the challenge of trying to figure out how to how to collaborate with others and so on. So, so it solved this collaboration problem and this uh, cloud setup problem uh, quite nicely. All right. Uh, Keith, what do you think? Uh, infrastructure is code, docs is code, APIs is code. What is it? It's all code. Sounds yeah. like. Uh, it, yes, exactly. Um, so I, I think we've kind of overcorrected in terms of like the, the entire DevOps paradigm. I mean, we, we've tried to package things up and make it self-contained and everything like that. And frankly, I think we've screwed up a lot. Um, we've, we didn't really think that one all the way through. We tried to, the, the way I think of it is that when we're building stuff, we're still stuck thinking about the underlying infrastructure, all these underlying components, all these, all these systems. And we've like pushed more and more of those concerns into the development ecosystem. And, and we've had to force developers to understand more of that. And frankly, I think it's a pain in the butt, um, we need to like redraw those lines. And I think some of the architectures are how we're doing it 
where we can sort of separate and segment and say, look, uh, you know, separation concern style and say, look, these components are, they're all over there. And I think using those as kind of interfaces to be able to, to section off things and simplify things is a good move. Um, I think we're still swinging the pendulum the wrong way though. I think, you know, Kubernetes is, is the hotness and everyone's trying to do whatever the latest trend is today. Uh, KubeCon is next week, for example, and there's going to be some great thing announced there. And there's going to be an entire swath of people that says we must upgrade to these things immediately. And I, I, I would encourage them to stop and take a moment and go, okay, do we have a need for this? Not even saying don't use it, just saying, do we have a need for this? And try to uh, evaluate that before they upgrade to the, the latest, shiniest thing. Because uh, I'm, I'm afraid we're, we're introducing more and more complexity and we're blending dev and ops in ways that devs aren't familiar with and ops have no insight into. And we're having all kinds of problems as a result. But um, this is one of the places I'm a little less optimistic, but uh, I hope we get our, like clean up our acts here soon. All right. So if you're if you're uh, spraying kids off your lawn here, then uh, what's a what's a better way to think about it? Um. Yeah. Wow. You just call me out for being old. I love it. Oh, uh, you're you're going to do it to me. Uh, so I got to get you first. Yeah, that's that's true. That's fair. Um, to be clear, it's not don't use any of these tools. I really don't have that perception of things. What I would say is stop and be thoughtful about it, because Odds are in any tech role, you're only going to be there for a couple of years, but you're going to leave your friends behind and your friends are the ones that are going to have to maintain the sucker. Or if nothing else, six, 12 months from now, after you've mentally flushed your cash and you've moved on to another project, you're going to have to do something on this project or on this component. And the more predictable it can be, the more consistent it can be, the more on version 1.1 of things instead of version 0.9 of things that can be, the better off everyone's going to be. So I, I wouldn't say don't use the tool. I'd, I'd say be thoughtful about it, be very diligent about it. Make sure you're investing in tools that have a lifetime longer than just your project. Yeah, I think the uh, the buzz thing you describe of like, oh, a new thing just happened. Uh, I always call this like hashtag architecture. It's like whatever's trending right now. Got to be part of the hype train. It's like, no, you don't. Uh, James, I'm sure in the course of, uh, I, think, I think out of the group here, you definitely touch the most companies. Uh, <laughs> so I'm sure you've seen, you've got a hall of horrors of things you've seen in this realm. Uh, but maybe uh, maybe you have a more positive spin than Keith, but we'll see. Uh, well, we'll see. Uh, yeah, I, I'm in agreement with Keith. The, the sentiment there is, is, you know, we're complicating things unnecessarily. We're not asking why or do we need this? We're just jumping on saying, well, everybody else is doing it, so I need to as well. This is obviously the direction we need to go. Um, I've seen things uh, go well inside the enterprise with these kinds of new stacks with Kubernetes and other types of things related to them. Uh, I've seen them go poorly. Uh, the ones where they went well is where they made them transparent. They hid it from the developer. As a developer, I don't want to have to build myself the uh, YAML uh, uh, config files, resource files necessary to deploy something in Kubernetes. I don't shouldn't have to know about Helm necessarily. Um, I think most of the organizations I've worked with that have success with it, they determined it made sense to use it. Uh, they put in the right groups, platform groups to to stand it up, manage it, and put OpenShift or anything like that on top to make it easy to deploy. So it's no different than in a Heroku type of deploy where we just do a get push and things go out to the right location and things are configured properly. And that means leveraging, uh, you know, the, the development disciplines, you know, infrastructure as code in the way that we do it. But it doesn't necessarily mean that the developers need to be burdened with understanding all of that for deploying something fairly straightforward inside of an enterprise. Um, there's always the exception, there's always the 10 or 20% that needs to have very strict control over their deployment environments, but most of them don't need to. What I have seen though on the infrastructure side that's really fascinating, uh, a few years ago, I had an opportunity to work with the device manufacturer uh, and I got to see what is it like for a network engineer and what does it take for them to configure network devices? So going even a stack, a level or two below that down to layer three, layer four devices. Uh, what does that look like? And, you know, we've had things that have come up like uh, Yang models that help to define in a declarative way. What do I want my network to look like? We have NetConf 
and eventually rest comp that puts a rest spin on the net comp world where I can just say, let me go talk to this device or this controller and ask for something to be done and things happen. Whereas before you would have to shell into a device and, and make a change. So now we have this brand new, or not brand new, but recently introduced role of the network automation engineer. They're learning Python, they're learning REST, how to consume it. They're building uh, JSON structures, JSON models to push out to devices and to do that at scale so that they can repeat it. They're treating it like code and checking in their network configurations into a Git repo. And to me, that's fascinating use of APIs because now we have all these devices that don't require shell access. You don't have to go in through SSH and have to use this, you know, really strange um, configuration language or anything else. We can leverage the things that we've been doing here as developers for years with REST and JSON and, and Git and all these different stacks and things. Uh, and, and to me, that's, that's powerful. And what that's doing is making it easier for the developers in turn, because now that's something the developer doesn't necessarily have to do. This can be repeated and deployed at scale. It can be deployed across multi-cloud environments and everything else. So it's changing the way the API world sees APIs because now we're going to a whole different level. And when you work at that level, instead of at the app level where you're building APIs as product or you're integrating APIs into your own app or you're tacking on an API for automation to your existing app or whatever it is that you're doing and you see network engineers uh, writing Python scripts and checking them in and getting super excited. They don't sit there and type the same command over and over again, or copy and paste a script from a text file in or, or something else and, and hope that that text file doesn't get lost or that they backed it up appropriately. And now everything's in Git and it represents the entire network and, and so on. That's really powerful. And we're starting to see that come into Kubernetes and those other stacks as well. And that's where the power really lies in is I think making use of the APIs so that we don't have to use the APIs as developers, you know, we don't have to do all the configuration and set up and management. Yeah, I mean, I'll say uh, for my money, I love nothing more than being able to spin up an environment for a test, uh, do a disaster recovery drill in a couple hours, like, uh, there's so many huge advantages to seeing it done well. But uh, yeah, I, it's complicated. And uh, James, to your point, the further down the stack you go, the worse it gets. And this idea that you know, DevOps will lead to some kind of uh, environment where everyone's a DevOps engineer. I think uh, he's like, yeah, no, you probably don't want that. <laughs> no, definitely not. But but there are there's some fascinating technologies that people haven't seen. It there's GNMI, which uses gRPC to configure devices. So you think about these things where a lot of organizations are still REST first or whatever else, and and in the device world, they're starting to look at and take advantage of things like gRPC. Uh, and build on top of that. Now, Google's leading a lot of that and kind of pushing their weight into some of the device manufacturers to incorporate that in. Uh, but it's fascinating to see that uh, these technologies are, are taking root and uh, and allowing us as developers to kind of step away. But what that might mean is we as developers might be tapped on the shoulder from somebody in the organization that's in the network automation space and saying, hey, can you can you teach me a little Python or can you tell me what this REST thing is or what this JSON is or tell me how to make sure my JSON's correct, you know, show, you know, and introduce linters to them and things like that. So there is going to be kind of a lot of teachable moments, I think, and a lot of support that we can offer to uh, our, our fellow, um, you know, uh, folks that are doing a lot of work down at the lower levels. Uh, they're starting to look, their job is starting to look a lot more like ours from the development perspective. All right. Um, so across the course of this, uh, James, you just mentioned like uh, gRPC. I think somebody mentioned GraphQL earlier, or maybe I just heard an echo. But um, <laughs> there's certainly lots of uh, lots of ways to do APIs this day these days. I guess um, some of that also comes with a lot of different audiences uh, as to what might be appropriate. Um, so Keith, I, I guess I'm curious on your take from kind of all the ways in which you could build APIs, uh, you know, what would you pick, right? How do you think about um, kind of which tech to pick uh, these days with all the weird options out there? <laughs> with all the weird <laughs> options. Uh, They're all weird, yeah, right? So I'm I'm going to be a little curmudgeonly here and or, or maybe back to the pragmatist roots and say, choose the right tool for the job. Um, I always start with like understanding what the domain model is, understanding what problem we're solving, understanding like from beginning to end, here's the flow we want people to take. 
Um, I, I believe the the vast majority of API use cases for most organizations, there's probably under 10 flows that the vast majority of customers need. Uh, at Okta, we did some internal analysis and uh, pulled the sales engineers. And I said, what are three to five things every customer wants to do? And we came up with probably, I, I hit probably 25, 30 different sales engineers. And there were eight that above and beyond were involved in almost every single customer deal. And so if I was building APIs for those, I would say, okay, how do we make those eight use cases better? And it might be REST, it might be GraphQL, it might be gRPC, I don't know. But let's optimize for those. Let's make the majority of somebody's job easier, faster, um, simpler, less code and everything like that. And then figure out the rest. So I'm not wed to a particular tech. I would say whether it's REST or GraphQL or gRPC, whatever, choose the one that, that meets most of the customer's needs. Now, that said, if you're working with a big legacy company that's not used to these things, choosing a tool or, or choosing a uh, protocol or structure that's familiar to them that they have tooling in, it's probably going to be useful. So if you're working in, you know, insurance, I would, if knowing very little about insurance, if I had to bet, I would say that they're probably in the rest space now. They probably haven't adopted more advanced or complex things than that. So make sure you're meeting your audience's needs. James, any different take? Uh, no, I, I agree with Keith in that, you know, start, start from the need. And so I actually, in <laughs> gratuitous plug, shameful, shameful plug here about the book. Um, I, I show in the book how to design APIs and I do it specifically uh, by starting with what are the outcomes, what are the needs of the end users, everyone that's going to be involved, and then breaking that down into steps and that eventually turns into what I would call an API profile, which is a style agnostic or protocol agnostic representation of what your API needs to do, allowing you to pick one or more protocols that you want to use. So if you want to use REST or if you're kind of say a REST first organization, you could do that. But then maybe you want to use GraphQL to have response shaping. So you want to leverage the query capabilities. So let's take what we just modeled and that we already understand and let's go ahead and build maybe one, one slice of that in GraphQL to support what we need. Um, so, so that way you can, you can have the right style or the right protocols in place for what you need to have and then your documentation is building up along the way. So you are able to leverage that and kind of carry that over between the different um, different protocols as you get into and start documenting your API, building your open API specs, uh, designing your GraphQL schemas and embellishing those with comments and so on. Um, so I, I would start there. Uh, on a, on a uh, more controversial topic though, I would um, caution a lot of people against GraphQL. And I know I'm probably gonna get a bunch of tomatoes thrown at me right now, but I think people are jump, jumping onto it because it works great on their laptop. But what I've seen, and I've saw, I've, I have battle scars to prove, when you go to operationalize things like that, that, that don't use the uh, protocol, but tunnel through it, it becomes really, really difficult to operationalize it, to secure it. Uh, in the SOA days, we saw that with web services. You would have this middleware, just like we have API gateways, you'd have middleware that would look and enforce validation rules and make sure that, you know, requesting get all the way to your web services until they had been blessed by the infrastructure. But they had to have code on them to recognize what that payload looked like because we couldn't assert based on a path, based on a particular HTTP method, anything like that. We couldn't take advantage of HTTP layering, a core characteristic of the protocol itself that's built in the specification. We couldn't take advantage of that. So we'd have to crack open the payload. In that case, it was XML and you'd be parsing it, looking at it. So your gateways had to understand the semantics of what's going across the wire. So anytime you go and change a web service, you would have to, at the same time, deploy the change to the gateway so that our incoming request wouldn't apply the old rules to the old payload, not to the new one. So you had these coordinated deployments or distributed monoliths as we call them today in the microservices world. And so just because it works on your laptop and you can whip something up pretty quick, doesn't necessarily mean that it can be operationalized, monitored, managed, secured in an effective way, in a consistent way. And uh, I don't know many developers that 
you know, want to spend a lot of time building their own security stack um, and things like that. So, you know, there, there's a little bit of caution there. So it's finding the right one. If that's the right thing, if you have a structure that represents a graph, if you are a GraphQL, uh, sorry, a GitHub or Facebook or something where maybe you have, uh, you know, in the GitHub case, a repo that has an owner that has repos that have forks that response shaping and able to go in levels deep and that sort of thing is really valuable. But to the day to day, it oftentimes isn't. Uh, so uh, going back to what Keith said, you need to understand what your problem space is. You need to understand your consumers and what they're comfortable with, um, what they're going to want to use and how they want to interact with your systems via your APIs. How do they want to interact with your products and then pick the right one? And, uh, and make sure that it's going in the right direction. Because otherwise, you'll think that you're doing the right thing and you have the best of intentions and you go down that path and you realize, oh, I can't put data entitlements in to filter one field without cracking open that payload and looking at things and implementing something that's really, really difficult to manage. Um, so just, just a word of caution. I, I know that I'm probably not going to be the most popular person for saying that, but I think we all can agree that not every programming language is meant for every purpose. And likewise, not every API style or protocol is meant for every situation that's out there. So just weigh your options, understand, and don't understand just how to code it, but understand how to put it in production, operationalize it, and secure it. Um, so, and one thing, I just uh, saw a question come in on the chat that asked if there's a blog post outlining some of the pitfalls. Actually, if you go to another gratuitous plug, uh, apideveloperweekly.com. I have a newsletter that comes out weekly and there's actually been some recent articles and I'll have them in there. So if you want to jump on there, Keith and I put that newsletter together several years ago and we just hand curate some articles. And uh, thank you, Bailey. So that's that's one thing to go check out. It's going to come out this Thursday and you'll get to see some other people's uh, battle scars as well. But uh, just be careful of that. I'm also seeing some patterns where we'll pick multiple styles. So we'll have GraphQL for our entities and we'll put REST on top of it. Oh, but we need an experience later. Let's put GraphQL on top of that. And then we have these multiple layers and good luck trying to troubleshoot that and figure out where the problem is at. So there's, there's a, a lot of things that I see day to day in these organizations that they started out with, with uh, great intentions and they end up just falling, tripping over themselves and causing a lot more problems. And then it's kind of hard for them to undo it after a while. So just Proceed with caution, be careful, weigh it out, prototype if you need to, talk to your consumers and uh, and find out what they need and then meet their needs. Yeah, I always uh, point folks to look at how much money uh, Apollo is making in the last few years, uh, James, to take advantage of the coordination problems that you're describing uh, that seemingly over time will always end up uh, being the thing. Uh, yeah. Tom, a little bit different spin uh, for you. I guess with you know all these different kind of ways to do this stuff um, coming out, and and I think in a lot of ways increasingly a, a lot of new kinds of audiences for explaining APIs. Uh, you know, how do how should tech writers approach trying to take all this in and and keep up? Yeah, you know, this is this gets to one of the most uncomfortable parts about being a tech writer in the in the developer space is when you have a project that's an API in a language that you're not very familiar with. Maybe it's a C++ API and a Java API. Uh, it's always you know, difficult because it's hard to know what the user doesn't know. I mean, if, if you're not a developer, how do you know what they need to know? Because usually as a tech writer, I'm like, gosh, I need the basics. I need so much you know, fundamentals here. And the developers will always say, oh, no, you the, the developers will know that the users, they will know that, you know, and, and sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. But it puts the tech writer into this big question mark zone where it's like, well, where is the starting point? But I think uh, what I usually do in situations like this is try to focus on like definitions, field definitions, descriptions of methods. Is it is it clear? Do I get a sense of what this data that we're that we're sending people even is? There's a lot of work that that. Uh, tech writers can do there without getting lost in the weeds of uh, trying to articulate code samples and so on. Um, also, one one kind of function that tech writers do is sort of bring people together. If if we say, hey, we've got a code sample here that illustrates how to use this idiomatic API. Um, 
And I don't know how to evaluate it. I don't know if it's a great code sample or, or if it's uh, poorly, poorly uh, coded, but I will bring together partner engineers, uh, product managers, other engineers, and try to facilitate dialogue and help them move towards agreement. So in that sense, you know, the tech writer is more of a, uh, somebody who helps bring people into agreement, who forces uh, documentation to move along and arrives at that sort of endpoint. And then uh, we'll monitor and say, you know, our users are having questions and so on. And if they, if they are, uh, we can bring those back to the teams and force another iteration of things. But, but you don't have to like, you don't have to, to know all these different languages because it becomes almost impossible. You don't have the sort of time to, to, ramp up and become proficient and even if you did uh you know the knowledge a tech writer has is so much smaller than a developer that it's not really all that useful anyway um so yeah it's it's definitely like the the scariest part of doing api documentation uh but it doesn't have to be yeah i think uh i think everybody knows that engineers these days you know it's like impossible to keep up but um i, I feel like tech writers get the worst end of it because it's like you got to deal with all the hashtags that developers have decided to engage in and uh, and keep up in a way that they don't even really understand it so <laughs> uh, well, and, uh, let me let me jump in there just for a yeah. second as as a guy who's usually focused on api adoption and driving more usage like people woefully underinvest in API docs. So Tom, I appreciate your, your work because there are three times that people use API docs. When they're first getting started and they're saying, does this thing solve my problem? When they're going deeper and they're saying, okay, this solves my initial problem. Can it solve it better? Can it solve more problems? How do I actually productionize this, operationalize it? And three, when they have a problem, when they've hit some sort of issue with the API and they're going, what the crap is going on? And those are three times that you desperately want good, accurate, complete information in front of someone. And as an industry, we fail at that miserably. So API docs done well have the potential to touch users at the moments that they are making major decisions and deciding whether or not to invest deeper, invest, pay you, all those different things. Done, we, we do so much of it poorly. So um yeah, we, we need it better. We need it more. We need complete, accurate, um, and fully realized information out there, or things are just going to go to crap even faster. Yeah, you know, even at a bare minimum from a documentation perspective, like a tech writer should make sure that that all fields are actually documented. I've run across so many APIs where there's not a description of any of the data that's coming back. There's there's like not even a description of what certain parameters are. You know, just even completing the empty check boxes there is is half the battle. So a funny sidebar on that. Uh we at Ingrock we recently launched webhooks.fyi. It's just a, a resource site for webhooks. Um, but when we were digging in all this webhook documentation, we found there were a few dozen webhook providers that didn't even show a sample payload. So they're saying, use our webhooks, but we're not going to show you what they look like. And then they said, you must verify your webhooks. But then there are steps for verification. There was no sample code or even pseudocode. It was like a bulleted checklist of like, get this field, then get this field. That is just straight up disrespectful to your developers, to... You know, I, I'm not a Python guy, but if you give me a snippet of Python, I can kind of reason through it and go, oh, okay, this is what's happening. Let me do it myself. So like I said, accurate and complete, that's so easy. The bar should be so low, and yet we are not even doing that. Sorry, th this is my soapbox right now. That's all right. It's a good segue. I was just going to say time check. I want to make sure we leave a little time for questions. Uh, Keith, I'm going to count that as your hot take. Uh uh, James or Tom, any uh, two minutes for a hot take? Uh, like what's something that you think is, you know, uh, that you have an opinion that's counter to the trend? Uh, I'll go first um, because this segues on the, the documentation. So here's what I see. Uh, things are becoming much more specialized and complex, and there's lots more options for everything. Um, as a result of this, like increasing specialization, I think most people are getting tunnel vision. They're they're getting lost in the depth of an API, and they're not really seeing 
the larger picture, the 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 system, the the ecosystem of APIs. Uh, and I'm trying to kind of develop and bring out this sort of systems thinking perspective and say, well, how does this API relate to this other API? And how do the 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 how does the data here relate to the data there that we're delivering? And how do they all work together? Uh, what are the dependencies, the connections, and the workflows, and the developer journey through it all? That larger picture is becoming lost in this world of increasingly specialized knowledge. And so I want to emphasize that as kind of a, a way for tech writers to provide more value, uh, because I think the engineers are becoming equally specialized, you know? Um, it, it's really something, th this big picture that connects all the different um, points in a developer portal, and brings that these APIs together into one coherent kind of whole, that's something that, that's worth emphasizing. Uh, for my hot take, I, I think I'm one of the things that I'm really seeing heavily is uh, this idea of the, the API productization in enterprise. It's putting some pressures on the way that we're designing our APIs today. A lot of organizations are being told, build microservices, go that way, you're going to get reuse. And I challenge them to think about reuse in a different way. There's local reuse, reuse amongst your team or maybe between a couple of very specific teams, and there's global reuse. Uh, and I think a lot of times the CIO wants to see the global reuse. They want to see reuse through productization of the APIs, through being able to externalize things to partners, to customers, whatever it is they want to do. And the result of that is people are fi finding that their microservices are falling short, that their microservices are not products. Um, shocker, but a single microservice is rarely a product in and of itself. It usually requires a lot. And as developers, I don't wanna be the integrator of your microservices. I don't care that you use microservices. What I care about is, uh, just like Tom was saying, I have a job to be done, I have a problem and I want an outcome to be achieved and I need to get there show me how to get there. Don't tell me what your architecture is. Show me how to get there with your documentation. Don't make me navigate lots and lots of different docs, each one for each service in some service catalog. So I think what we're gonna see is we're gonna see a, a trend where a lot of organizations are gonna start rethinking their services. They're probably going to start, they may be calling them microservices, but they're probably gonna be a little bit more coarser grained or they're gonna be modular monoliths. Um, Kelsey Hightower from Google always loved, he had one quote that said, there's no rule that says you can only have one monolith in an organization. We can have modular monoliths that have a defined scope that are very clear and have an API around them. And either it's a product or it contributes to a product. But uh, I think a lot of people are realizing that if I have a lot of microservices, the amount of calls over the network that it's going to take for me to achieve something and the amount of problems that could come up. I don't want to deal with as a consumer. You might be okay with dealing with it in your infrastructure. You, you may have you know, put out all of the, the latest and greatest tools and you've got that solved. But from my perspective, I want something that I can call an API on and know that it's transactionally safe. And I don't care what you did behind the scenes. So I, I'm really seeing a trend where I think we're going to be shifting back a little bit. It's not that microservices are going to go away, but I think people are going to be a bit more pragmatic in the way they go. And uh, because the focus is going to be on global reuse, not local reuse, and that's going to require a different mind shift. And it's going to be kind of probably swinging the pendulum back just a bit from how far we went where everything's a service. All right. Thanks, guys. Uh, I'm going to pause for a second here. Um, Bailey, I assume you've been keeping track of uh, comments and I've been trying to look, uh, but do we have any burning questions? Um, our first one, what strategy for maintaining docs would be interesting for big companies with a complex and multidisciplinary context? Probably a Tom question. A little bit. Strategy <laughs> for maintaining docs in a big company with multidisciplinary focus. Well, you know, this is not a, a sort of new problem, right? You have a ton of docs. How do you keep them up to date? And I've seen various attempts at this, like regular kind of nags at, at people who own pages. Um, honestly, uh, I think what, what my approach has been is to sort of look at where support logs trend. If a doc is out of date, but nobody uses it, is it worth fixing it? Not really. It's the docs that people complain about. Remember that 80% of 
the usage comes from 20% of your APIs. And that 20% is usually something that's the, the topic of support logs that surfaces and so on. This is one area where I'm really hoping the AI, AI tools will help out. I want them to kind of mine support logs and surface up like trends and look through long threads and summarize the answer and pick out the solution. Uh, that would make docs uh, so much easier to update. So yeah, uh, hopefully the AI tools will help us just focus on that 20% of the really worth updating sort of uh, content out there. And speaking of AI, will generative AI help with the perpetual battle with linting style and overall consistency? Sorry, well, with linking style or? Linting. Or, oh, linting style. Is this another doc question then? This, um, no, I, this is probably more yeah, standard yeah. style guys. Yeah. I, I think I'll chip in a bit here. Uh, just, you know, at Stoplight, obviously we have, uh, you know, Spectral, our open source project for uh, sort of linting APIs, right? That's uh, sort of increasingly become a bit of a de facto standard. Um, the, I don't know, like, Here's what it boils down to is, you know, what we've seen with uh, with what a lot of folks do with Spectral for linting APIs is look for what other people did and copy it. Um, and that's not a disparaging phrase, uh, but that's to say that if if you set down the average, uh, you know, even passionate about APIs developer and said, write me some all the rules in a programmatic fashion that you can lint for everything. Uh, they'll say, be like, well, okay, I'll call me back next year and I'll be, I'll, I'll get started. You know, uh, like it's a lot to, to wrap your head around. So um, I think there's opportunity for sure to sort of, you know, use tools uh, in the AI space to sort of generate those things. But back to our problem of if we're building a big bespoke infrastructure and all this kind of stuff to really scale something, um, I, I'm pretty doubtful that most folks are going to trust a programmatically generated set of rules to enforce how all of their platform works, at least in the you know foreseeable sort of near term. Um, it's far more likely. Uh, I mean, what do we see in typical API design discussions? Folks to get together for the first time say, what's our API going to look like? Well, I want it to look like Stripe. I want it to look like Google, or I want it to look like Microsoft, right? They name off the things that they like using and then copy it. Uh, so I think, yes, it could, but in reality, most folks will just look to copy what's already out there, which I think is great in the sense of people coming together around a common set of what works, as opposed to, you know, let's see if this uh, machine will tell me what works predictively. But I, I think that's actually where the machine is going to shine. If you say, here are examples of good API patterns. I think it can take those and then check your own against those. And it's not, it may not be able to fix them. That's fine. If it can flag them of like, hey, look, this is an area of concern. You know, this is not matching what you've already declared as good. Then, yeah, I think it could be a great linter. It could be a great sort of, um, you know, uh, referee to be able to go, oh, wait a minute. Let's, let's stop and take a look at this. So, I, I think we need to do this, do that sort of thing more. Like I, I mentioned earlier, memory collect or garbage collection. We don't have to think about garbage collection anymore in most of our languages. I think most of these tools, most of these capabilities are going to take that thing where they're just quietly working in the background, flagging things. It's like clippy, but good. It's, I need to buy that domain right now. It's not already taken clippy, but good. All right, what else we got, Bailey? I believe the rest have been answered in chat or throughout the conversation. Yeah. There was one in there and I'm I'm dying to to chuck a stone at it. Sorry, but is it uh, uh from Justin? Uh have you have you all ever heard of Hasura IO for GraphQL solution? Addresses some of the concerns that James brought up. Um, I have heard of it and I'm painfully aware of it <laughs> without going into too much detail, uh, because I've had to work with it quite a bit. Um, I'll just say that. Um, there's a lot of advantages in Hasura because it it kind of gives you this like free auth layer for GraphQL and sort of access control stuff, which looks really attractive. But it does not absolve you of having to understand how GraphQL works uh, at its core uh, in order to keep it secure. Um, and I think the idea that Hasura is going to be the, you know, 
uh, it's GraphQL all the way down kind of thing uh, in terms of like, you know, you just put that in front of your database, build an app on top and all your problems are solved. I can tell you from personal experience is absolutely not true. And in fact, I think Hasura is probably better suited for like, you know, walling off legacy data systems and giving you a more elegant interface to them. But as far as like building your whole stack of an app on Hasura, I I would highly caution against it. Uh, I've had an expensive couple of years learning that lesson. Um, yeah. James or Keith, I'm curious uh, if you guys played with Hasura yet. I have not. I don't have direct, uh, direct hands-on experience with it. What I'll say is I've, I've worked with a lot of... Um, of other similar types of products in the past like that. And that's always been my experience as well. Usually they'll fit really well into the stack and do something, you know, one or two things for you. And uh, so, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's a good fit for some organizations. Um, one of the things that I really struggle with is that with, when we're building APIs, designing APIs, use HTTP, we have a specification to lean on. When we're dealing with things uh, like GraphQL, we have a specification, but it only goes so far. And then we have to depend on the vendors to kind of fill in the rest. So we're, I think, still a little early days on that. And so maybe they or, or other vendors will come out and help to solve some of this problem, and make it a little bit more manageable uh, and a little, little less painful for some people so that we can take advantage of it. Uh, I'm starting to see GraphQL really take off in, in sort of the, the, data, the data space. People are just trying to figure out how to turn their data sources uh, into something that can be uh, used within R and other types of of tools to uh, allow business analysts to get access to things so they have to have direct data connections or understanding how a data lake is uh, created in the background and so on and so forth. So there's going to be some interesting use cases there, and I'm hoping the vendors can help us kind of get there sooner. Uh, but I don't have any one on you know hands on on that particular one. Yeah, I haven't worked with Asura either, but I'm skeptical of any framework that says instantly do X. Because, uh, you know, like like I said earlier, a lot of your use cases will come down to, you know, eight to 10 different things. And odds are this will solve those those frameworks in general. Set aside Hasura. These frameworks in general will solve those 80% cases really well. I mean, look at, look at how Rails got its start. It was by building a blog. You know, the, the infamous 15 minute building a blog site. That was amazing. The second you step out of those use cases, though, is the tool going to enable you and enable you to do things faster, better, more secure, simpler, whatever, or is it going to be a hindrance to you? And if you don't know that going in, please, please, please play with it. Do a coding spike, explore it before you commit to anything because you don't want to have to be in the situation where two, three years from now, you've completely outgrown your tooling. And now you're like, ah, oh, crap. Now I have to rewrite this API. No one in your organization above you is going to appreciate that news. Uh, it's, it's what one of my friends, Cal Evans calls a resume generating event. <laughs> nice. Well, guys, I think we're uh, time's up here. Uh, I first want to thank uh, guests for you know uh, taking the time and and putting questions out there and and being engaged. Uh, hopefully, this was helpful. And uh, again, thanks to our uh, our um, our experts here for helping us navigate the uh, increasingly deep waters of the API world. <laughs>